Welcome everyone. My name is Joseph Katz. I work with Kettle Space. I'm here with my colleague, Mac Mayer, who is running controls today. I uh, welcome you to Building Blocks of Personal Finance. We're excited to have Eric Cooper present. A uh, few housekeeping notes. We are recording once again. Uh, feel free to drop in the chat any questions you have uh, during the presentation. And Eric or Mac or myself will address them at the appropriate time. After the event, Mac will send everyone an email with a link to the recording and any follow-up items from this event. And this event will be addressed in a number of different buckets. So we'll try to stop in the different points to address the topic in more detail with questions at that time. And then a, a kind of a roundup Q and A at the very end. Um, once again, so it's all fair warning, we are recording and we are live. Uh, so I want to just, before we get into the meat of the presentation, give everyone a little bit of a background of how this event came to be. So we have a thriving community and we've had events throughout the pandemic uh, and prior to the pandemic as well. And we've had a number of requests for this topic of personal finance. And we are thrilled once again to have Eric join us and um, present. So let me give you everyone a quick background on Kettle Space and what we do. So Kettle Space is a real estate technology company. We're based in New York City with a robust technology competency, a network of inspiring workspaces and expertise in both operations and community development. This event is part of that. Uh, we partner with organizations to engineer custom solutions that address COVID challenges while also developing smart and sustainable hybrid headquarters solutions for uh, when people go back to work. Uh, Mac and I are happy to answer any questions about Kettle Space at the end of today's event. And you're in for a big treat today because Eric has a wealth of knowledge and hopefully you got the pun there uh, and is gonna bring today's, uh, today's event with a lot of energy. Um, Eric is a wealth manager at ELC Advisors. He started the firm to provide, provide the same financial advice to Main Street that wealthy insiders at large investment banks employ. Eric has worked in mortgage banking, sales, and trading, and wealth management at several well-known firms, including, including Goldman Sachs. Without further ado, please welcome Eric to the Kettle Space Zoom stage. Eric, take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction. Feels like a lot of pressure, and I didn't understand the pun at first, but I finally got it, so well done. <laughs> uh, today, we're gonna talk about uh, the building blocks of personal finance. Uh, we will hit kind of in varying order, but we're gonna go over briefly on goals. We'll talk about budgets. We'll talk about debt, renting versus buying. I know some of these look, I think we're scheduled for three presentations, one today and then two subsequent, subsequent weeks. So we're kind of get through debt today, if you will. And then we'll uh, pick it up following with rent versus buy, talking about some, I think insurance is covered today or no, next week, some investing, which is where I spend most of my time, uh, kind of the power of compounding, some of the psychology around money and then fire, which is financial independence, retire early, which some people are aspiring to in today's environment. So who am I? You hit a beautiful background. I was an economics major. I've worked in mortgage banking, buying and selling loans during the period at which the economy blew up in 2007 and eight. I think I had just joined Goldman then, it is not my fault. I've worked in institution sales, selling research to hedge funds. Uh, I've worked at private wealth management, Goldman Sachs, basically working with the, the rich of the rich, investing their money. Uh, about seven and eight years ago, I started my own RIA, a registered investment advisory to tackle the space, knowing what I took from inside, what I call the inside baseball of Goldman Sachs and trying to bring that to Main Street and telling my friends and family, here's how they invest inside the firm. Here's how you should invest. So uh, it, I had my eyes opened and I thought there'd be a way to go to market with a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit to help some folks invest the way that, you know, the way I do it, the way I like to invest, which is just all low cost index funds. Okay, so what is the goal? The, hopefully the takeaway from this for any attendees is we just wanna be help people empowered by money. So it's such a fearful topic for so many. Some people love to just play ostrich and go, eh, I don't wanna think about it uh, because sometimes it gets scary, it's emotional, it seems really complex. Uh, it has a lot of emotions and problems around it, let alone just the technical difficulties of what is money uh, and what, how should we think about it, right? 
So what is the problem? It seems taboo. It seems intimidating. A lot of us grow up, we take what? 12, 13 years of primary education. Most of us go to college. We have another four years. A lot of us get a, go to, hell, even if you get your MBA, they don't teach this often. They'll teach you technical uh, financial analysis, but they don't teach personal finance. We, so we make it through 20 years of education. My wife has a, a PhD in mathematics. She didn't learn anything about personal finance from that whole stretch, right? So obviously you learn along the way and then you just hear things and you have programming. So I think it's important to address the topic head on. So we know 40% of households can't afford a $400 emergency. That's very problematic in our society. The average debt carrying household has $9,000 or more in debt. That's at a typical APR of anywhere from 15 to 22%. So you're paying 22% in interest on $9,000 in debt, that's really problematic. 21% of Americans have no retirement savings. 10% have less than $5,000 in savings. Well, you're never gonna get a leg up in the world. So APR math is scary, <laughs> is the annual percentage rate. So uh, that's how much you're paying in interest every year, sorry. Um, so, but you're never gonna get ahead in life if you're, behind the eight ball, if you will, if you're paying high interest rates and then you're trying to save. So some people say, oh, I need an emergency fund. that will keep $1,000 in a bank account, but they have $3,000 in credit card debt. You'd be better served to pay down that credit card debt as quickly as possible, then use a credit card as an emergency, right? Okay, so what is the cure to all these problems we have? I think it's really important that we have an open dialogue around money. So we're, this could sound a little funny, but we have more dialogue around sex and those conversations with our friends and family and whatever, then we do money. Why? And I've never understood why it's taboo, what someone makes, what they save, what they invest in. Uh, so I think it's really important to understand this is a journey for all of us and all of us are in different places. So we need to have an open dialogue with, you know, first ourselves, look in the mirror, understand what the problems are. Maybe you don't have any problems. You just wanna know how do I get a little bit better with my money? That's great too. But I think it's really important to develop strong fundamentals uh, and develop the right habits around money. So this is a typical kind of uh, roadmap of what happens. So everyone is different on this roadmap. So we often, we start off with a whole lot of debt because why? Everyone told us we have to go to college. Well, was even the college, was that the right advice? For some, it wasn't. Maybe it should have been trade school. We came out with $100,000, $200,000 of debt. Maybe it's only $30,000 in debt. But now we can't find a job and we have a art history degree that didn't necessarily make sense for us, right? So even questioning those decisions earlier on, I think we need to have an open dialogue with our friends and with our peers. So on the debt journey, you typically get it, hopefully you get a good job or you start something that can pay you. You start paying down your student loans, you start paying down car debt, uh, you start thinking about a 401k as you advance in your 30s and 40s. Obviously none of this applies to someone who had a big tech startup and they sold it at 25 for a billion dollars. Good for them, that wasn't me. I grew up on a farm working poor and it took me a long journey to understand how money worked, how finance worked. Uh, I had some good mentors along the way, but so this is the, again, the typical journey. So at some point you start having big goals. I want a house. Okay, that's great. So you start saving for a house. I want kids. You start putting away in your IRA. So the thing I would question, do you need a house? And this will be uh, next week's topic, but kind of rent versus buy. What? Why do you need a house? Does it even make sense financially once you consider taxes, maintenance, mortgage expense, et cetera, et cetera? So then as we move along in life, you typically hit, you have some money. You might have 100,000, you have a million, you might have 3 million. What do we do with that money? Here's the roadmap, right? So ultimately we all want to get to here, independence in life where you've accumulated enough wealth. So it combined with social security, maybe you have some inheritance, whatever your story is, what is your money blueprint uh, to get where you can live off of your investments. So in order to get all the way to the other side of independence and affluent, I think you have to start with the right habits here and having the conversation and the dialogue around money and to make sure you have the fundamentals in the place. So the main takeaways I want you, for anyone here, if you just drop off the call from now, just look at this slide and just tell me to shut up and ignore everything else I say. These should be your main takeaways. It, money should be easy. Max out your 401k, at least to the employer match. So 
Most employers will do 50 cents on a dollar up to 6%. So a free 3% money. Don't leave that free money on the table. There's debate about if you should fully max it out or not. Uh, we can get into that later. You should buy inexpensive, well-diversified index funds. Stop chasing Bitcoin. Unless you want some really small exposure, stop chasing AMC Theater, stop chasing GameStop. These things are fun, but that's gambling. All right, we, we'll have some more conversation around Bitcoin later on. That's a different thing. That's kind of all the headlines. But I go back to don't buy and sell individual securities. You think you have better knowledge than all of Wall Street that's trying to find the right stocks and the right funds. You sitting at home doing your research because you spent 30 minutes a day watching CNBC and reading Forbes. I would argue that you don't and you'd be better off just an index fund. All right, so save 20% of your money. That could be in a 401k, an IRA. Hopefully you do a savings account for your emergency fund. Again, I mentioned earlier, don't carry a, a credit card balance. Really important. You don't want an index fund. Good question, Nick. An index fund is instead of just picking Apple, Google, some technology companies, Chevron, Exxon, what maybe people hate big oil, but instead of picking individual stocks, you can buy an S&P 500 index fund, which is the 500 biggest companies in America, generally speaking. Um, and you buy them all in one fund with one purchase. So you don't have to go through and buy 500 individual companies. You can buy them all in one fund and it'll cost you three basis points or 0.03%. So it's a really cheap thing to do. You can buy it and hold it and dollar cost average, keep buying the index fund. Okay, hopefully I answered that. How do I know it's a low cost index fund? Good question. Anything, any index fund, you should look for Google index fund expense ratio. And the expense ratio should be under, I would say 25 basis points. So that's 0.25%. But the truth of the matter is it should really nowadays in today's environment be under five basis points or 0.05%. So you can find Vanguard funds, Schwab funds, Fidelity funds, State Street. They all have index funds that have a very low cost associated with them. I think state street funds or where the spiders are called low cost core funds, okay? So that's what you wanna Google. So anything under 0.10% is low cost. If something is 1% or more, it's, it's a raw deal. You're not, you wanna stay away from it, okay? Okay, so pay your credit card balance every month to, you know, so your high APRs, you're getting behind the eight ball. So let's try to keep that at zero. So now, as we mentioned, pay attention to fees. I think actively managed funds tend to have high fees because they're paying a bunch of MBA Wall Street types to try to outperform the market uh, in order to get you more investment return. But research has shown over decades, it just doesn't work. Okay. So the building blocks, what we'll just, today we're gonna discuss kind of this bottom row. Uh, next week, we'll kind of hit the second row. And then the last week, We'll hit kind of this top, the purpose investing. I, we just touched on this a little bit of investing. I kind of, I like to talk about this a little bit like the Maslow's hierarchy needs. Like you got to get these fundamentals down. This is kind of food, shelter, and clothing down here. Like figure this out. Then you can build and think about, okay, some security. What are the things that start to fulfill you? And now it becomes an emotional, am I fulfilled? What is my purpose in life, right? So psych 101 people, that might resonate. I also like to call this kind of the sadness versus joy pyramid. These are sad things that we're gonna discuss today. Like this shit's no fun, it's just not. Sorry, I don't know if this is a language area or not, but it's just boring. This gets more interesting because now you've actually accumulated some assets, you're investing in your future. You can buy things that are fun, homes, cars, whatever, or you're putting away for retirement, like that's exciting. And then up here is really, this is the existential questions up here. like. What is my purpose in life? What should I do with my money? How do I want to give it away? How do I want to provide for the next generation? So I think these are the fun parts. These are the, the nuts and bolts. This is like, you got to get this bottom row down. Otherwise you're really behind the eight ball. All right, any questions before I move on? Eric, since I got mic control, <laughs> um, talk a little bit about the journey you showed a couple of slides back. It's, it's great depiction of life. Is there an age that people should start having these conversations or, you know, with their loved yeah, ones? So I kind of throw, this is kind of societally where we are. This is what happens, right? 
I think the sooner you can advance this independence, emerging affluent and big goals, the sooner you can shift all that left to the beginning of that slide, the better off people are gonna be. I know, you know Nick and I, we used to lift weights together in college. You think we talked about any of this stuff? We would have been a lot better off <laughs> if in the weight room in college while we were playing sports that we also said, hey, are you thinking about your investing strategy? What are, what are you even talking about? So the further you can shift and do this, my one regret, so what I think it's a Buffett saying is like the best time to start investing was 30 years ago. The second best time is today, right? So the, the sooner we can shift all these conversations to earlier in life, the better. But that's not necessarily the case. Some people are 65 years old and have never invested. Well, it's better late than never. So I think it's important to always have a dialogue. Um, but the sooner you can start thinking with the end in mind, I think it's important to find that purpose, if you will. Do you think that education should happen parent-child or peer-to-peer? -peer? You know, I think this Robin Hood thing has been bad in many ways, but I think it's uh, has made a whole generation wake up to finance and trading and what does it mean? So it's better to lose a thousand bucks when you're 18 than it is to lose a hundred thousand when you're 30, right? On a terrible trade. And a lot of people have done that both at 18 and 30. So I think addressing it with kids. So this goes back to, you know, a, a little bit silly, but we're more comfortable talking about sex than we are money. It, so kids don't know what their parents make, maybe rightfully so. And I have a reason for that. Uh, I think every kid should be indoctrinated early and often. You know, I know when I start, I started working at 12, 13 years old on the farm, but I was indoctrinated early because I didn't trust my family. I saw their bad money habits and I wanted to buy a pair of Jordans. There was no money to buy Jordans, right? So I got a paper route and then started working on the farm so I could buy Jordans. I had my own savings account, right? So I was indoctrinated early because I had to be, because I just didn't come from the greatest background. Uh, but if, if and when you can have these conversations with friends and family, I think the earlier, the better. Sounds good. Sounds a little bit like Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad there. Yeah, right. <laughs> he, I have a I'll riff on him later. <laughs> Looking forward. Okay. All right. So cut my, Maslow's hierarchy needs, if you will. Here's the building blocks we'll hit upon. All right. So Let's, you have to begin, and you kind of touched on this, like you've got to begin with the end in mind. What are your money goals? So if you're just saying, oh, I want a, I want a car, but I don't think about anything else. Like that's not big picture enough. Like I think you need to start to your point, uh, start with, I want to retire at 55 or I'm 40 and I want to retire at 65 and I've not yet started saving for retirement. What do I need to get there? What are those steps I take today? Um, so understanding your why, uh, we talked about it briefly, but what are your feelings around money? Like have this dialogue, like find a safe place and space for people. I joke in my job as a wealth manager, it's, you know, 20, 30% kind of the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty of the actual products and structuring things. A lot of it is a, a life coach, almost a, a psychologist dealing with money because people have feelings about it. Like what? What do you feel about your money? What is your money bl blueprint? Do you think rich people are evil? Do you think poor people don't work hard enough? Like those are terrible programming cues because neither one of those things are true. There might be in some unique instances and maybe you had uh, an interaction that was bad, but I, I think it's important to you know understand what your feelings about money are and then how do you express that in the real world, right? Uh, so what are you trying to accomplish? Begin with the end in mind. Money should be a tool for individuals, not the goal. So again, this is a little bit beginning with the end in mind. What do you want from your money? Most of us just want freedom. That's the only thing I've ever wanted, my freedom. I want to be able to do what I want to do without being told, I don't want a boss. I don't want to be told what to do. So now in my practice, all my clients are my boss and I have to be responsible to them. Everyone has their own boss in some regard. Even if you're the CEO of a publicly traded company, your shareholders are the boss or you can lose your job, right? So everyone has a boss in some regard, but it's about trying to get to a point to, for me, money is freedom and security. Like my negative programming was gr growing up. I had a scarcity mindset because resources are scarce and have worked hard to get to an abundance mindset and be like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna be okay. So 
at first it was, okay, I, I want to have 10 grand in the bank, then 50 grand and then so on. Right. But the end being shouldn't be just the money. It's just, really, they're just a numbers on a screen. We see that what can happen, the, the fed can print $1.9 trillion every few months when they want to. So it's really just digital assets on the screen, but what is, what does it really embody for you? Right. Um, so we're going to talk about throughout this, develop a strategy, strategy for your money. What are the nuts and bolts that you're trying to get through? Uh, it's important to understand the fundamentals back to the previous slide. You got to get this stuff right. You got to do this before you can even think about this. So what are the goals for the money? And then set goals to suit you. Don't worry about FOMO. Don't worry about your buddy bought a new big house or a car. They took some trip, get off Instagram. Like set things that matter to you. We're all so uh, impressionable by what we think matters versus finding out what actually matters to us, right? So I think it's important to have money goals that align with your core values, whatever those may be, right? Maybe, you know, you're a big church goer and all you want to do is give as much money as you can to the children's program in your church. That's great, do that. But make sure that you're defining the goals and not your money blueprint from your family or friends or whatever. Make sure you're think, having an honest conversation with yourself around what you want to do with your money, right? Any questions, thoughts? Yeah, I agree, Mac. I think people do need to, uh, oh, in this here. Yeah, share your goals. What, what, is, what do people want to do with their money? And it can be frivolous. If you want, you know, you want a new Ford Explorer, get a new Ford Explorer, put that as your goal. I don't care. <laughs> I was talking to the guys earlier. I have a client who has a golf simulator in his living room that his wife lets him have. I think it's the most ridiculous purchase of any person on the planet. It brings him joy because he loves golf. Good for him. It's a good thing they're not sponsoring today's webinar. Yeah, right. <laughs> good goal. Cars are good, vacations are better. On cars, get something that's three, five years old and reliable, brand new, you're gonna depreciate 20% plus as you drive off the lot, right? So yeah, it might feel good, but then it's just sitting in your driver in your garage. So get something that's three years old, let someone else wear the depreciation, get something that's reliable. That's my input on that. Retire my 40s so we can spend more time with our future kids, love it save more, invest more, dollar cost average every day. I like those. Okay, so more, a little more about money psychology, right? So we all have programming that we don't really understand that we have. So here are a few kind of select. So this, there are books written about this and I can leave some resources with y'all, but a lot of us are susceptible to these, right? So let's go through them pretty quickly. Confirmation bias, when you believe a tendency to remember all the things to support the belief while conveniently forgetting all the things that are on counter. That just means you made a decision, it worked out, and now you, you think you're right. That's, that's it, I can't be told any differently. You start getting tunnel vision and close off to what the world is, right? So some people who bought GameStop a year ago at two bucks or whatever it is, and they sold it at 400, well, they're the best trader that's ever lived now. That They're wrong, they're not. They got lucky, that's confirmation bias. Okay, survivorship bias. When you come in correct conclusions based on what survives without taking account the data set. So most data sets exclude all the losers. Uh, history was written by the winners, right? So what we think, and this is not to be political, but. I learned this summer about uh, everything that happened in Oklahoma through the Black Lives Matter because I was never taught about what was going on uh, in history because the winners, if you will, wrote history. There was all this Black Wall Street and the whole community that I thought was just made up. And like, what is what are people talking about, right? Because in some regard, that was survivorship bias of the winners writing history. So what happens in today's day and age is active mutual funds attract all the money. The one right now that's happening, if you Google ARK, I think it's ARK Technology Fund, A-R-K, uh, maybe it's two Ks, um, they are attracting all, such, all, all sorts of assets because they've had an incredible run. Uh, I don't know if it's lucky or if their process is better, um, 
but you know what? There's 40 other funds that thought they were smart that won't be included in the data because they didn't make it, right? So this is where we'll get into later. It's like why I think active management doesn't uh, make sense. Okay, next one's, this is one's really important. Pretty important for me is fear of losses. You make rash expensive decisions without the market to even itself out. So what does this mean? Oh man, we just all experienced this. If you have a 401k, the amount of people that called me when the pandemic hit, you said, oh, what do I do? What do I do? The right answer, the academic answer was, you know what? This money is for 20 years down the road, buy more. This could have been a buying opportunity of a generation almost because stocks went on sale by 20, 30, 35%. So I joke that the stock market is the only place in the world that when things go on sale, stocks get cheaper. People run away. Every other thing you think of, when things go on sale, people can't wait to go buy it. But in the stock market, people are fearful when they go on sale. That's exactly when you should be buying it because they are fearful of losing money. People doing that today don't invest. I So right now, if you look at valuations are stretched, so the PE ratios are high, meaning stocks are expensive. So all a stock is at its core is the future value of all cash flows uh, discounted back to today's value. And that is effectively the stock price, right? So what happens, where do you get uh, multiples come from? What is the actual stock price? It is the future value of those cash flows time a PE multiple, right? Um, to get to that stock price. So right now people are fearful of losses because the valuation feels stretched. So it's again, reframing the question, what is this money for? It's for way in the future, right? So if you have a 20 year timeline, you should be dollar cost averaging, meaning investing in small increments every month or every few months along the way. Uh, why do I think that is? If the P ratios are high, should I not buy in today? Okay, so this comes down to process and discipline. When clients are asking me, here's candid conversation I'm having. I have some money to put to work. What should I do? Here's a little inside baseball. In 2008, this was just before, yeah, I was at Goldman. I think it was, it was during the crash. Lloyd Blankfein, then CEO, came into the Houston office and said, people asked him, what should we do with our, what should we do with our money? This is the CEO of Goldman Sachs. I'm sitting two feet away from him. He, um, and people want insight, all the private wealth advisors in the office. And he goes, well, if you're not sure, do half now and then half later. This is the CEO of Goldman Sachs and that was his advice. Half now, half later. I was like, thanks, bro. Thanks for the insight. Like, that's not helpful. So the real answer is we don't know what the markets are going to do. The markets can keep going higher, irrationally so. They could tank tomorrow. We literally have no idea. So it's a matter of having the right asset allocation that you can sleep well at night with. So if you have, let's say you have $50,000 to invest in the market and you have a 20 year time frame, well, get invested over the next 18 months, split that $50,000 into equal increments over 18 months and dollar cost average in every month. Jumping in and out of the market, I think I referenced in this slide, is, is kind of a loser's, uh, is a fool's errand. So what you really want to do it's, it's the time in the market and not timing the market because you want the market to grow. You want the dividends to come back and accrue to you and reinvest those dividends, okay? All right, so fear of losses, so not investing. Okay, next one, anchoring bias. All right, so high anchor. Anchoring bias, this happens all the time in retail, right? You'd be like, oh, the Gucci bag's five grand. That's not that bad. Now it's on sale for three grand. You're paying three grand for some leather. With, with some logos on it. But now it seems cheap because five grand seems, well, that, that's a little expensive, but for three grand, I mean, that's a deal, right? No, it's not. So now you know how I feel about consumer goods, but the same thing happens in wealth management when the industry standard is 1%. People anchor everyone in industry to 1% of uh, assets under manager. That's what mutual funds charge. That's what uh, wealth advisors like me charge. No, I don't charge that. That's way too high. But that's what guys working on Wall Street charge uh, and then they may charge you more. They may charge 1% advisory fee and then they might buy a mutual fund that charges 1%. And then they get a split on the back end because they've anchored, our whole industry is anchored to 1%. So let's make sure you, you're re-anchoring, you have a good worldview of what you should be thinking about. Okay, so overconfidence. This is a little uh, similar confirmation bias. Basing financial decisions on their expertise, we don't have. The, the prime example in my space is uh, not the social app. In 
my area of expertise is, I know I'm aging myself, Tom from MySpace, but in my area of expertise is doctors, because they're a surgeon and I have surgeon clients, they think they know more about investing in finance than me. I'm like, all right, dude, you made a lot of money being a surgeon. I do this all day long, right? So you might be a great coder. It doesn't mean you know anything about design. Like, sorry, I know they're both in technology, but th those are different things. And maybe, maybe you're a full stack developer and you can do everything and you're amazing, but that's not necessarily the case. So I think having overconfidence, like this is just about uh, uh, to know what your blind spots are, right? Okay. Any questions? Okay, moving on. All right, so a balance sheet is important. What is a balance sheet? All right, now you still got, you got an income statement, you got a balance sheet, you got a cash flow statement, oh, finance, accounting, it's terrible. It is, I agree, it's terrible. This is the bottom, this is the sad part of the Maslow's hierarchy needs. You just gotta figure this stuff out in order to start building upon it, right? So a balance sheet is just your assets minus your liabilities to get what you get your net worth, right? So what you own versus what you owe. So you, it's important to understand what are your bank accounts, investment holdings, homes, cars, whatever. So all of your assets subtracting what you owe. What debt do you owe? Student loans, credit cards, et cetera. So I think this is important and an easy exercise, fairly easy. You can do it on a yellow pad. Uh, if you don't know where you are in life, right? How are you gonna get to where you wanna go? So I think this is taking a, a serious inventory about where you are that most people just don't like to do because it's uncomfortable, frankly. You're like, oh, I have a negative net worth. So if you look, my median net worth, so the middle, $11,000. People are gonna go, oh, I've been working my whole life and I'm worth 11 grand? That's not great. So the average gets pulled up, obviously skewed up by wealthier people is $76,000 for people under 35. Again, we're all on our own money journey. There should be no judgment. People are all over the board, right? It doesn't, were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth? That's neither good nor bad, it just is. Were you born destitute and you had to work to, to pay for everything? Not good or bad, it just is. But I think it's really important to take an account of where you are today. All right, so we're gonna go through five, quickly, five different types of budgets. So one, this is literally, you just take a spreadsheet, top to bottom, list everything that you ever spend. Tedious, boring, but you wanna keep track of all your monthly expenditures. Do this every single month. So the easiest way to do this for most people is just go to your credit card company. Uh, by the way, well, actually I'll talk about that in a second. Go to your credit card company. You can download typically for free. It's a CSV file. You don't have to have Excel or whatever. Even if you just have a, a, a Chromebook or a phone, you can open that in a Google sheet it's all free and it'll list out your spending habits. Now go ahead and spend two minutes categorizing it um, and understand where you are, right? Uh, so now if you have cash expenditures, whatever. So this is again, just figuring out where you are. What are your expenditures? Most people don't even, I don't like to look at my personal credit card. I know as long as it's under a range that nothing's awry, like some months, I'm like, oh my God, what happened to my credit card? I was like, oh, I bought new tires last month. I was like, now that makes sense. Or I had to book some travel for work well before when we live in a normal world, when I book travel for work, then I'm like, okay, there's something outstanding. So I'm at the point, I kind of know within a hundred dollars, mentally $200, what my budget is. So I don't do this anymore, but it's important if you're just starting to, to line item everything. So it's the same thing. If you're running a business, if you're an entrepreneur, you should be really going through these things because maybe someone's paying for their Netflix account uh, on the work thing. And you don't, you, that was not a, a, an approved expense, right? Okay. So the second type of budget, Proportional budget. This is easy. Needs, wants, savings. 50, 30, 20. Just go ahead and break down your budget. So your income statement. So your income minus expenses, right? Now categorize that. I've got to pay rent. I got to have a car or subway or whatever transportation. I have to pay insurance, homeowners, etc. Wants, I should have put eating at home as needs, but wants, eating out, travel, shopping. Okay, that's fine. But savings, emergency fund, are you funding your HSA? Are you funding your 401k? Are you funding your IRA? Uh, so these are just broadly categorizing things, the very big picture, right? Okay, so the third type of budget. First of all, are there any questions on the first two types? Pretty easy, self-explanatory. I think the important part is we're just thinking about it. 
pay yourself first. This is my preferred budget of choice. Generally speaking, as long as I'm meeting my investment goals, as long as I'm maxing out my IRA, as long as I'm, you know, doing the things that I've set out long term, that top line. So this is a good goal. Save 25% of your take home pay. Maybe that's a stretch for people. Maybe people after all their take home pay are minus 20%. Well, that's problematic. That's why we're talking about the budget in the first place, right? So, uh, but it's important to think about paying yourself first um, because no one's gonna take care of you. Yeah, there might be social security when you retire, but if you're not being proactive about doing what you need to do, um, you might have problems down the road, right? Okay, so no need to track all your expenses, but if you're deeply in debt, this budget's just not gonna work for you. Let me look at this question. Once a year, I was surprised. Yes, I agree. So if you look at your expenses and budgeted just a little bit, you go, oh, I'm paying for five streaming services. I only watch one of them. It could literally be that simple. Now you just save yourself 50 bucks a month. Okay, so the envelope budget. This is widely known as Dave Ramsey budget. I know, so this kind of goes in with his debt snowball. It's a thing, it's out there, it works for people. He has 2 million Instagram followers with their success, um, they paid off their debt. This one's not for me. If it works for you, I think that's great. I think carrying cash is dangerous, dirty. You have to go to the bank. I think most people can exhibit enough self-discipline to use a credit card. I think the other thing that's important about this, instead of having a, an envelope for a budget, like put it on a credit card, it's actually easier to track every line item. And if you think about our society at large, there is a two to 3% fee imposed on every transaction in society. What are you talking about, Eric? That's stupid. Uh, no, it's not. It's called credit card processing fees. We are all subject to them and all of society is paying credit card processing fees. Every credit card company is in competition with one another in a bank. They give you rewards points. They give you cash back. They give you all sorts of free crap for using whatever their credit card. So take advantage of that. And that's kind of why I don't like this. I think people can be responsible enough to not go into debt as long as they're thinking proactively, pay off their credit card a month, but take advantage of credit cards. Not to mention they insure all sorts of things if they are broken, if your TVRI is broken, your credit card often. Uh, we'll cover it if you're playing, if you're trip, they all have travel insurance. Like it's actually worth look, reading through the terms of service of your credit card. They track an ungodly or that will cover an ungodly amount of things that you wouldn't even think about. Okay, so zero sum budgeting. This one is uh, very specific, but if you just kind of think about your dollars as soldiers and you're putting them out to war, you have a job for every single dollar. You're just very specific. So whether it's savings, discretionary spending, it's creating a budget. And at the end, you will have zero dollars left because every single dollar is accounted for. Uh, I think this one can be tedious. Uh, I think it's easier to start big picture, pay yourself first, max out your accounts and let the rest fall with May. But you know, if some people like to really get into the weeds uh, and are really attentive to details, I think this budget can be a, a worthwhile thing. Okay, questions. That's all I'm, I'm scheduled to talk for today. I'll go back to this Maslow's hierarchy needs, if you will. So today we kind of talked about, oh, we're we gonna talk about debt today. Should I hit that, guys? Sure, I have a quick question for you on uh, budgets before you move forward though. Yeah. You talked about the net worth. How often should someone do that calculation? Obviously, it's not going to be a, a weekly or a monthly activity. But. It absolutely can be. If, if that's what you're focused on and if you're in debt and you're trying to plug away at it, like I think it can be obsessive and can be problematic. So back to the goal of you know money shouldn't be the end goal. But if you're just building, I think a monthly check-in is good. I think a monthly check-in with your, your partner, your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, if you guys are open and sharing about money, Again, this just goes back to dialogue and knowing where you are. So that might seem excessive, um, but I don't think yearly is often enough because you, you've kind of forgotten about it. Like it, it's more about holding yourself accountable, right? So if people are on their fitness weight loss journey, you wouldn't say just weigh yourself once a year. You probably do it weekly, if not daily or at least monthly, right? That makes sense. Uh, I got a couple of <clears throat> questions in the chat. So uh, 
to your uh, past, do you recommend paying off debts, loans, credit cards before starting investing long term? Long term. Uh, yes. So I, I'm actually going to hit that in a second. Debt consolidation. I think it can make sense only if you are going to be disciplined once you do it. But yes, it absolutely makes sense to take out a five or six percent personal loan to pay off a credit card that is 22 percent. So it's about arbitraging those interest rates uh, that you don't want to be subject to those credit card interest rates. Some people, maybe it makes sense to take, if you have home equity, I'm not saying you should necessarily lever up, but you might be able to take out a home equity loan at 3%. And again, this is, I don't want to put good money after bad, if you will. You shouldn't <laughs> lever yourself with a home equity loan and turn what should be a monthly turn of a credit card into a 10 year loan that now you have on a draw and a retainer, that's terrible. But to consolidate debt down, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Yes, I actually use the mat, I'm reading comments. I like the app Mint, I use the app Mint. I would also consider uh, you need a budget. You just put in chat. Did that go in? No, I'm on a direct message here to everyone. Sorry, you need a budget. I think this thing, you need a budget, it's like five bucks a month. Um, and they have some like nicer budgeting tools and uh, Mint, which Mint doesn't let you categorize very well, but I do use that and it can, uh, good for net worth tracking. Uh, let's see. If remaining student debt loan is low interest, 2%, how would you prioritize paying that down relative to savings 401k? Okay, great question. Here, I'm actually gonna go down these debt slides. Let me, let me briefly talk on credit score and then I'll get into that question. So what is credit score? We probably all know what it is. There's three main companies, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion. They're the credit mafia. If they have your stuff messed up, then your life could be ruined. It's not great business. It's a monopoly. The Biden administration is talking about maybe changing that, have an agency where uh, the credit score and record becomes uh, more regulated, if you will. Um, so Mint, as we mentioned, this actually provides a credit score. Annually, you can get your full credit report. It doesn't provide a score, I don't think, but if you go to annualcreditreport.com, it's worth at least once a year per agency doing this. Maybe in the first year, you do them all at once and then just wait a year because you could do it quarterly. That makes sense, splitting it up. But it'll show every bit of your credit history from all of time, right? Uh, so it makes sense to pull this and look at anything. And if there's anything amiss or outstanding or it doesn't make sense, it, you can proactively go address this. So why is that important? What does it even matter? Who cares what a credit score is? Well, if you want to exist in society, if you're an entrepreneur, if you want to buy a home, if you want to get a car loan, all these things are wildly impactful. So you can briefly look to that. Bad credit score is three to 600. Decent 600 to mid 700s. Uh, anything above mid 700 is a good credit score. Why does this matter? Because it could save you not just like single digit thousands, but tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of your lifetime. So what's a good example? If you can get a mortgage with an 800 credit score, well, today you can get a mortgage at, I don't know, two and a half, three percent. Compare that to someone who's a high risk borrower at 7%. If you look at the mortgage amortization tables, I know I do a lot of weird things in my free time that most of y'all don't. But if you look at mortgage amortization tables, the first 10 years are heavily skewed towards interest. And if you're paying a 7% interest rate when you could have had a 3% interest rate because you have terrible credit, then you are subject literally to tens of thousands of dollars over the life of that mortgage that you wouldn't have paid with someone who had a good uh, credit score. So I think that's important. All right, so let me get back to that question, 2%. All right, so outstanding debt. So. Here's one way to think about it. Debt snowball. This is again, the Dave Ramsey. List all your outstanding debts. Smallest to largest, pay the extra toward your small debt. Pay it off until you've paid off your smallest debt. Roll that money into the next smallest debt. Keep going until your debt is gone. Why do I think Dave Ramsey debt snowball advice is terrible advice? Because it doesn't make sense financially. Okay, it makes sense psychologically because you say, oh, well, it's the smallest debt. I only owe $5,000 on this. But if that $5,000 uh, has, let's say a 5% interest rate, and then you owe something, you have a credit card that's $10,000 and that has a 20% interest rate, 
it doesn't make financial sense to pay down the 5% interest rate well before the 20% interest rate. It just there's a spread of 15% that you're, you're hurting yourself with, right? So how does this play into this question? If student remaining student loan debt interest is low, 2%, how would you prefer saving that down to savings 401k? So I would first prioritize paying down debt. Uh, savings is earning you nothing, right? What is a savings account? You want to, someone want to tell me what their savings account is? Even a high yield online savings account might be getting you 50 basis point or 0.5% or zero. That's a better answer. That's if you were at a brick and mortar, this is another aside. I would recommend not using brick and mortar bank unless for your kind of operational account, because once in a while you have to go in person, sure. But for savings, only keep the minimum amount in that brick and mortar account uh, bank. So the Wells Fargo, the Bank of America, you see them in every corner. And then you should be utilizing a high yield they're not high yield nowadays, but generally higher yielding online savings account. I know Marcus has a product by Goldman Sachs, Discover Bank has one, Capital Bank, uh, Capital One 360, I think has one. So just Google uh, high yield online savings account and put any excess money in there and that you're just paying an interest rate game. Um, so yeah, you're paying SoFi, perfect. That, that That's the perfect thing. Uh, so, but to get 0%, yet you're paying 2%, I think you should start prioritizing paying down your student debt. You know, maybe the Biden administration is gonna be wonderful and cancel 10 to $50,000. I don't know what that looks like, but that could be a great thing for some people. Um, the next thing I'd say, so this is a, an arbitrage game of, should I do savings versus 401k or debt versus 401k? So the long-term historical average of the stock market, 10%. Probably actually a little higher. People go, no, that's not right. That's right. 10% over 40 years. You can argue if it's going to be lower going forward or not, or if we're due for a correction or the PE multiples are stretched, but it's generally been 10%. So the argument would be, well, I should invest and I'd make that spread 2% versus my leverage and I'd make an 8% spread. This comes down to peace of mind. I don't like risk. I rather pay down anything that is a debt or an obligation or a liability well before I start speculating on what is supposed to be 10%. And then for someone like me, I'm a 60-40 asset allocation. What does that mean? 6% stocks, 40% bonds. So my ongoing return is 7%, maybe a little lower because bonds are so terrible right now. Um, so that becomes, I think, it, how can you sleep well at night? How should you prioritize your money? Uh, I'm one a big proponent of getting out of debt and never having it for as long as possible, except maybe housing debt when it makes sense. All right. So what about the savings account and credit unions? Yes. Credit unions are good. They're typically there for the community. They get basically a special government sponsor, a credit union to like a, a charter to be in the community. And they typically pay above average rates. The one thing to remember about all these is when you're giving money to a bank, you are now, I don't think this is problematic in the credit unions, you know, they have savings amount, uh, FDIC amount. So as long as you're not above, that's fine. But typically a credit union, you will become a creditor of that credit union because they're taking your money and turn around and lending to the community, right? So as long as it's a well-managed, reputable credit union and you don't have above whatever the 250 or whatever the numbers are, I think credit unions are great. Okay, questions? I'm gonna move along. So the debt snowball, paying the lowest balances first, even if it's high interest rate. I don't necessarily agree with it. I prefer if you're in a debt hole is a debt avalanche. This one makes financial sense. The other one might make a little more emotional sense. And if that's where you're coming from, that's great. Like do the emotional thing, something that you can keep on track. Like, again, we're all on our own money journey, but I think about this more in spreadsheet terms than I do like uh, emotional terms, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. So list all your outstanding debts, rank the debts in order highest to lowest interest rate, make the minimum payments. So you're not subject to fees and penalties. Cause that can actually make the APR or the interest rate jump up much higher than you even realize if you're subject to fees and penalties. Uh, and then with all the money pay extra on the high interest loan. So this one makes financial sense, pay on the loan. That's 18% and just do the minimum payment on the loan. That's 5%, right? Um, Keep going with that process to all your debt is gone. Let me hop in these questions here. Credit unions, yes. Uh, yeah, I think the Marcus deal, we're gonna, 
So if you look at, so this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but fixed income, so bonds, if you look at the treasury yields have just been, they've plummeted, right? And so Jerome Powell, who now uh, is Janet Yellen, chairman of the Fed, uh, has basically come out and said, we're gonna keep rates lower for longer because the Fed has two mandates. They want uh, low unemployment and consistent growth. So what is growth as measured by CPI, the consumer price index, they want two, per, two to 3% growth a year without having inflation. Right now, I think we might be a little more inflationary than the uh, environment thinks, but they want to keep interest rates down to uh, foster growth because if you think about it, we've had a K-shaped recovery. The market has recovered, all this liquidity has been thrown out, unemployment is still terrible. So I think uh, that was a long way of saying is I think the market's, market's saving rates will continue to either be flat or go down because there's no uh, impetus for them to raise them because the, the treasury yields are so low. Okay, next question. Does it ever make sense to put more money towards saving for a down payment on a house towards your 401k, assuming the recommended 5% won't get you a house anytime soon? Uh, yes. So here's what I say about investing. If you have money shouldn't be put into the stock market or investing or 401k unless it's 10, 15, 20 plus year goals. If you're, and you can say longer than five years, you'll probably be fine. But if your goal is five years or less, and your goal is to buy a house, save that money for a house. Why gamble? Why risk? Because the market we don't know, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but it could fall 30% tomorrow and then not recover for four years because we've seen it now in my investing lifetime. I've, we saw the, the, the pandemic has happened. It recovered remarkably well. Uh, the financial crisis, that took a while. The dot-com bust of 2000 took a while, 2001, whenever that was. So we've seen this, there's a boom and bust cycle because again, humans are emotional and the animal spirits take hold and the markets rally and everyone gets scared and there's a tulip mania of the 1600s and people go, oh, the tulips aren't worth anything, let's sell, right? And that's, I made the joke earlier, it's like the stock market's the only place where people run away when things are on sale. That's when we should be buying, right? But that's fine. But to your answer, uh, to your question, I think if your goal is five years or less, if you have a short-term goal, five, six, even seven years, you're trying to buy a house, don't risk it. The one thing I would say is at least get the match in your 401k because then you're leaving free money on the table. Um, the other thing with 401ks, if you're a first-time buyer, often they have, uh, you can borrow from that 401k for a first-time home purchase. I don't think that legislation has changed. So that's something to look into, but at the very least get the match. You don't want to put nothing in there. And then the employer match of 3% or 50 cents in the dollar, 6% goes away. That's just financially foolish. Okay, Mac, I'm listening to you. P presentation on pause. Go ahead. No, no, I was saying continue, continue with, with your presentation. Oh, okay. All right, so we talked about this briefly, student loans. Uh, this is not my expertise. I went to a school because I played sports. I turned down other good schools where I didn't have to take on a ton of debt. <laughs> like I was a tall enough nerd that I could play basketball and they helped me with school. So I don't have a uh, great insight here, but the th one thing I would say is don't be an ostrich. People, they just ignore it because it's painful and whatever, they have $150,000 of student debt and I have an attorney friend who has gone through this and they're like, oh, the debt is growing because they're not even making the minimum payments. People will work with you. If you call them weekly, I know this is not how you want to spend your time. This is why I run on the bottom of the sad Maslow's hierarchy needs. But if you call them and address these problems head on and you communicate often with them, there may be a way to, to figure out how to consolidate debt, how to find another lender. Someone mentioned SoFi earlier. I think they, you can consolidate debt down with uh, a lender like SoFi. So there are ways to do it, but I think you have to be very proactive. Again, this is the same debt consolidation. So I've seen people uh, help people, this, I wouldn't recommend this, but if you had an investment account, you could get a margin loan for 1% using interactive brokers and consolidate that that way, as long as you have enough assets, right? Um, so there are games to play, uh, a cash out refi. So. I think these are bad habits to form, but there are ways to manage it. If you have equity in your house, you could do a refinance. Maybe you could even lower your rate and keep it the same and pay off some of that debt. But the only thing you've really done is taking that debt and now turn it into 30-year debt. 
the bank and they the bank now the mortgage company is going to get all their money up front instead of the credit card company. So I think you need to be really thoughtful or how you're approaching it. And again, this is like uh, just don't be an ostrich. Like the ostrich strategy never works, whether you know, obviously we all know in friendships, relationships, or whatever, you gotta just address this stuff head on, even though it's really painful. Okay, so I think Mac, that concludes my deck talk for today. Eric, that's been great. Um Looking forward to our next two sessions. The we're going to have our next session on March sixteenth. Hey, um, hey, just let me inter, let me just answer this last one. HSA, yeah, on. yes, I uh, address this later. I think somewhere in a presentation. Everyone, if you are in a high deductible plan um, and have access to an HSA because you're under a high deductible plan, which many of us are nowadays. Absolutely fully fund the HSA if you can, because it's literally the only investment product that's triple tax free. You put in money that you can claim off your taxes. It grows tax free. And then if it's used for medical expenses, it's tax free for that expense in the future. And that even means like 30 years down the road. The one thing I would, I would say is if you can kind of calculate your medical expenses, probably gonna be more in the future. There are investment options in your HSA. Don't let it just sit in cash, pick an investment option in there. So 50, 50, I don't care, 50% bonds, 50% S&P 500, but make sure you're getting the growth and the tax advantages and everything you can in that HSA, especially if it's delaying future medical expenses. Okay, sorry, back That's to you. That's okay. No, we're just running out of time, so I didn't want yep. to go over, yep. but uh, this is great, Eric. Tons of information. Uh, I'm sure everyone got a lot more than they were even expecting. And uh, that's why we recorded it so people can listen to the sections they may want to go over again. Mac will be sending out an email uh, after the event, after the recording is available, uh, along with links to register for the future events. On March 16th, we, you're going to be covering insurance, rent versus buy, and investing. And then on March 23rd, we're going to go deeper into investing. And uh, what I'm most excited about is hearing your thoughts on the financial system. So uh, that should be exciting and enlightening as well as engaging for everyone who decides to join us. Uh, Mac, anything else you want to end with? Otherwise, uh, I wish everyone the best.